Hey everyone, welcome to the Inside Java podcast. My name is David Delabasse and I'm your host for this episode, episode 16. Java recently turned 25. And if we look back at the early days, one of the many unique aspects of Java was the fact that it had networking capabilities built into the platform, into its core libraries. Back then, you didn't need to rely on any third party or custom development to support common networking protocols. Fast forward 2021, it goes without saying that networking support is now a given. Most of today's applications wouldn't exist without being able to somehow connect through the network to services and other applications using HTTP, socket connection, and so on. I recently discussed with Daniel Fuchs and Michael McMahon, both from the Dublin Java engineering team, about some of the recent change related to the network support in the GDK. And despite some small audio quirks, I'm sure you will enjoy this episode. Michael, Daniel, welcome to the show. Can you start by briefly introducing yourself? Michael, maybe you should start. Hi, thanks for inviting me on the program, David. Um, I work in the core libraries team in the, in the Java platform group at Oracle, mostly working on the networking classes and also to some extent on NIO. So I would be maintaining the network classes in Java.net and I also work on new features like the HTTP server, which came in 1.6 and also the new HTTP client API, which is more recent than that. Okay, thank you. Daniel, what about you? Hi, David. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm also working in the, the core libraries at uh, Oracle, and I'm currently uh, leading the networking project, and I'm looking at uh, the APIs and fixing bugs and working on new APIs as well. Okay, cool. Today, we will discuss some of the recent network updates done into the Java platform. And I want to make it clear, we will stay at the network level. So we will not today discuss security. That will be covered in an upcoming episode. First thing first, I think that from a developer standpoint, the most visible API that has been added into the platform in the last few years on the network front is the HTTP client API. So I'd like to start the discussion from there. So Michael, can you give us some background on that client API? Sure. Uh, first, maybe to talk about the the existing API, uh, that's the JavaNet HTTP URL connection. Uh, that's That's been around for nearly, well, 25 years now. Uh, so it's been around since the beginning of Java. Uh, in fact, one of its main use cases initially was to implement a web browser. So in fact, it, it, it has this common URL connection model for all, all different types of, of URL types. Uh, because like 25 years ago, HTTP was just one of uh, of many different URL schemes that that browsers needed to support. So uh, obviously, it's it's quite old and it has certain limitations. Probably its biggest programming limitation is the fact that it, it's blocking, so it ties up a thread for the entire duration of a request, regardless of how long how long that's going to take. Um, there was a previous attempt to define a new API around the time of JDK 1.6, but we weren't entirely happy with the level of abstraction that that, that produced, so uh, so we left that at that time. So to consider some of the motivations then for, for the new API, um, uh, obviously we wanted to fix the problems with, with the old API, which was too abstract because of all its needs to support um, all of these different redundant uh, URL schemes like FTP, Gopher, and Mail2, and so on. Uh, it had a lot of undocumented behaviors also, and not really enough control over HTTP-specific features like proxying and redirection and uh, that kind of thing. And also, it needs to be non-blocking, in this, at least in the sense of, of not tying up a thread for the entire uh, request while you're waiting for a response from the server. We also had a requirement to support the HTTP2 protocol, which was emerging at that time. So... Basically, we wanted to, to support a new API and a new implementation, which, which supported HTTP2, and also WebSockets. That was a requirement that arose at that time. And I suppose, finally, uh, in 1.8, a new kind of programming, asynchronous programming model was added to the Java platform based around completable future. Uh, so this is a kind of a useful high-level abstraction for, for non-blocking uh, kind of high-level protocols like HTTP. So that was probably the initial impetus for the work in defining the new API. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, can we have a quick overview? Daniel, maybe? Yes, so the HTTP client was added in Java 11. It can be used to request HTTP resources over the network. It supports HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2, both in synchronous and asynchronous programming models. And it handles requests and response bodies as reactive streams. It also follows the familiar builder pattern. Uh, it's a small API that is deliberately uh, compact. Mm -hmm. And in a nutshell, how does it work? Uh, so to, to send a request, you first need to create a HTTP client, and there is a builder for that. So you create a builder, and you can configure the per client state, like uh, the preferred protocol version, or whether to follow redirects. You can set a proxy selector. Uh, you can set an, an authenticator. And of course, a necessary uh, context for HTTPS and TLS. And once built, uh, the HTTP client can be used to send uh, multiple requests, of course. Usually, it would not be recommended to uh, create an HTTP client to send a single request and then uh, release that reference because uh, there are lots of uh, resources that are created to implement the HTTP client, and that would not be uh, uh, an efficient way of using a client. Mm -hmm. To send a request, you create an HTTP request, and similarly, it has a builder, so you, you create it from its builder, and you can use the builder to set the URI, uh, the request method, the request body, if there is any, uh, some timeout, and uh, of course, request headers. And once built, uh, an HTTP request is, is immutable, and it can be sent uh, multiple times. Sent synchronously or asynchronously, right? So re requests can be sent either uh, synchronously or asynchronously. Uh, the synchronous API block until the HTTP response is available. And one exception to that is uh, if you specify a body handler to read the response, which uh, will read the response as an input stream or as a publisher of byte buffer. And in that case, of course, that input stream or that publisher is written immediately and the calling code will either pull the data from the stream or uh, subscribe with a subscriber to the publisher. And on the other hand, the, the asynchronous API uh, returns immediately with a computable feature that completes when the HTTP response becomes available. Okay. So uh, you said that it was added in GDK 11. Uh, it started as an incubator module in GDK 9, right? Yes, it started as an incubator in, in GDK 9. In fact, I think that was the first incubator module ever. So it started to incubate in 9. It was made standard and permanent into GDK 11. And I believe in uh, 16, we have two new methods that have been added to that API. Right, Daniel? Yes, that's true. So in, in GDK 10, we, ha we had a refresh of the incubator module. And that leads to in its uh, standardization in, in 11. And in 16, we are adding two new uh, methods. Uh, one of them allows you to create an HTTP request builder from an existing HTTP request. And that's very useful because uh, HTTP requests are immutable. And what if you need to send the same request in response to the server with maybe some additional headers? In that case, you can simply create a new builder from the original request and change the request headers in the builder and then build a new request that you can send. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. The other method that we have added is a method that will allow you to uh, concatenate request body publishers. Um, writing a publisher is, is not completely trivial. We have many ready out of the box uh, implementation of publishers in the API. And we have added a method that uh, will allow you to build a request body by concatenating uh, these publishers. And, and that's very useful uh, in case you have a request body that contains uh, data that comes from heterogeneous sources, like uh, maybe you need to add some multi-part boundaries and then follow, follow up with a base64 encoding of a file content. And you can see that in this case, uh, it would be very useful to have a body publisher that publish a simple string and then a body publisher that will uh, publish the content of a file. And uh, concatenating those two 
with, with this new method is just trivial. Okay, yeah, makes sense, yeah. Okay, so that was, uh, in a nutshell, the HTTP client API. Now, I would like to uh, discuss uh, some JEP. So I look at the JEP list, and I've basically uh, picked three uh, network-related JEPs, and that is uh, JEP353, we implement the legacy socket API. That was done in 13. Then there's JEP373, re-implement the legacy datagram socket API in 15. And finally, there is a newer one, which is Unix domain socket channels in 16, as I said. So can we, uh, first of all, quickly discuss JEP353 and 373? So uh, I don't know, can, for example, Michael, can you give us uh, in, in one minute a very quick overview of uh, 353, so re-implement the legacy socket API? So what was the motivation for that, Jeb? Yeah, well, basically, Socket and Server Socket have a, a service provider mechanism called Socket Impl, which is actually a public class. And there's an implementation of that called Plain Socket Impl. And then that class is then subclassed into a number of different implementations, which do things like implement socks proxying and HTTP connect proxying. Um, it had a number of problems. For instance, it's, it has its own native code, some of which is, is very old, uh, because this, this goes back to JDK 1.0, and it's, it has special code in there related to very old Linux kernels, for example. Um, it also had uh, some unusual features, like buffer allocation was all done on the stack. So while that's quite efficient, it, it tends to limit the amount of space that you can allocate um, for, for, for buffer sending and receiving. So we, when the Loom project started up, it was clear that this would have needed significant investment to work with Loom. So instead of doing that, we decided, well, why not replace the plain socket impl with the version based on NIO? And then we would have we would only have one single body of native code related to networking then. And uh, we would get we would have other advantages like um sharing the buffer cache that NIO already has, and of course, uh leverage the non-blocking capability of of nio which which is needed for 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 loom and uh you know for, for to, in order to support fibers basically so if the work was done in a couple of stages um uh, we did some preparatory work where first of all we did some refactoring of of server socket channel to to reduce the combinations of of of, of customized third-party socket impulse versus the uh, platform socket impl that we provide. Um, we also changed the, the, the socket impl uh, into a delegation model so that it, it, it separates the, the HTTP and SOX proxying capability uh, and the de then delegates to, uh, to what we call the platform socket impl, which, which can, can be the, the old one or the new one. So then once that was done, um, we, we, we were able to uh, uh, add in the um, the actual NIO socket impl itself, and basically that's controlled by a system property now. So you still have access to the old uh, the old implementation if you need it, um, but by default, the new sockets and server sockets will will run on top of um, the the NIO native code by default now. Mm. And uh, just for my knowledge, what would be the use case of uh, using the old implementation? Purely for compatibility reasons, if, if I mean, we tried hard to uh, have the same behavior, there are still possibilities, particularly in the case where third-party socket impulse might be used. Um, so just purely to maintain compatibility for, for unusual use cases. Okay. Uh, and then there is these other JEPs, which is a kind of a follow-up of the work that I started uh, in 3.5.3. So that is JEP 3.7.3. Uh, Daniel, can you quickly go over that one? Oh, yes. So JEP373 has at the core the same motivations than JEP353. So the Datagram Socket and Mulcat Socket API and their underlying implementation are very old. They did back to uh, GDK 1.0. They have also a mix of legacy Java and C codes that is difficult to maintain and debug. And the, the old implementation was also using uh, synchronization and, and mechanism that do not play very well with uh, virtual threads. Uh, so we decided to uh, 
try and, and replace this implementation with something more modern. What we did is that we modified datagram socket and multicast socket to uh, delegate to an in another instance of uh, datagram socket and multicast socket. And by default now, that other instance of datagram socket to which we delegate is the socket adapter that is uh, provided by uh, the NIO uh, datagram channel. Mm. And what is the key benefit? The NIO implementation is, is much more modern and it's also more, more efficient. So we obtain quite a lot of uh, simplification uh, doing that. So there is still a property that you can set that will allow you to uh, revert to the old implementation in case uh, there is some dark corner case where the two implementation behaves slightly differently, but we're not anticipating that this will be uh, useful. So is it fair to summarize those two JEPs as refactoring of old underlying implementations to more modern implementations in preparation of Loom's virtual threads? Yes. And something I should mention as well is that in GDK 17, we are also adding some enhancements. Uh, for instance, the Telegram socket can now be used directly to join and leave uh, multicast groups. So you could just use plain datagram socket for multicasting as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that will be in 17? That will be in 17. Okay, cool. Now moving on. So we have this third JEP, which is uh, JEP380, Unix Domain Socket Channels, uh, which has been added in 16. So Michael, can you give us an overview of that one? Sure. Um... Unix domain sockets, they are very similar to TCP IP sockets, uh, except that they are only used for local inter-process communication. And they are addressed through file system path names rather than IP address and port number. So the motivation then for doing this, well, there are a number of benefits uh, for applications that only need to do uh, local IPC or IPC between containers for possibly. Um, so Performance is, is one benefit. By cutting out the TCP IP stack, we have found that does improve performance and CPU utilization. Um, it can also improve security by, uh, again, if local IPC is all that's needed, then you're not, you don't need to open network ports to the network. Um, and you can also make use of uh, file system access controls and user credentials for additional security. And also, what we found actually when testing it with Docker is that it can make it quite e a lot easier to set up communication between Docker containers because without this type of capability, you have to do that through TCP IP typically. So that's kind of the background to it. The feature itself is quite small in terms of API footprint. Um, and that's kind of because the NIO socket channel class and server socket channel classes are defined themselves using fairly abstract types such as socket address, which, uh, which is then subtyped into INET socket address for TCP IP. So all we had to do then was add a new subtype of socket address called uh, Unix domain socket address, which, which contains the path name of the client or the server. And then secondly, all it needed was an additional enumeration value to be used then when, when creating these new channels. And apart from that then, Basically, the socket channel and server socket channel APIs work basically as, as they would before. They can be multiplexed with other kinds of selectable channels, um, and you read and write to them and connect, bind in pretty much the same way as, as existing TCP IP based socket channels. Mm. So it's business as usual. The only thing that is specific is that uh, socket address type. Exactly, yeah. It, it's there's a new uh, socket address subtype called Unix domain socket address, and uh, that just encapsulates a file system path, uh, and that's what you use. You you would bind a server socket channel to that, or you would connect a client socket channel to an address with a path name in it like that. So it's 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 quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, something we didn't mention: uh, Unix domain socket channels are not Unix specific. That's true. Um, and in fact, um, probably the reason why we added the feature at this time is because uh, the feature has only recently been added to Microsoft Windows. 
So since an update of Windows 10 and Windows 2019 server, um, this capability became available in, in Microsoft Windows. So that meant that all of our major reference platforms supported the feature and uh, it seemed like a good time to add it to Java as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, can we quickly go back on the security question? So uh, typically with the network connection, you would you would enforce security at the packet level using filtering, firewall, and so on. Here you can't do that given that you are bypassing the TCP stack. How can you still enforce some kind of security? Yeah, so we, security is kind of at two levels. Um, you have the old Java platform uh, security model also. And for that, we took a fairly simple approach so that there is a single permission which enables or disables the feature if, if a security manager is running. So that's quite straightforward. But the main the main way you get security is basically through the operating systems. It's user and groups, the standard Unix file system model where you know you can you can restrict access to file system or to file system nodes through user ID and group ID. Um, an additional feature then, it's something that works on, on the Unix platforms, but not on Windows. So it's a kind of optional um, where user credentials can be obtained. Um, so in other words, if a socket channel is connected to a server socket channel, either side can request the identity of the user at the opposite side. So that's, that's an additional security capability, which works on the Unix implementations of this. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned that point, but it's good to reiterate it. So Unix domain socket channels are for IPC communications. And there's no socket, there's no open port. So that's an additional protection, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, if, if, if there's no requirement for, for remote access, then previously, you know, you would have, uh, you, you might have bound a, a TCP IP socket but expected only to get connections from other processes on the same host. But there was always this possibility that connections could come from other hosts on your network. But with Unix domain sockets, that's, that's just not possible. Yeah, that's nice. Now, um, performance, we are bypassing the network stack. So uh, do we have an idea of the benefit that we get by doing that? Yeah, we have a suite of, of micro benchmarks in, in the JDK, and we, we've added a couple of micro benchmarks to that suite uh, for this feature. And uh, we're seeing kind of roughly a 20% improvement in, in latency and throughput with Unix domain sockets as opposed to, as opposed to TCP IP over the loopback interface. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is quite a boost. Absolutely. Okay, so is there anything else worth to mention regarding that API? Um, yeah, so, so while the API is uh, architecturally fits in very well, this feature fits in very well to the socket channel API, there are some peculiarities, let's say, of Unix domain sockets that have always existed, you know, based on how they were developed originally. So for example, so when you bind a, a server socket channel to a port number, and then if you close that, that channel, then the port number is basically released. It's released immediately or, or very soon at least. But that's not the case for Unix domain sockets. It has always been the case that when you bind a socket to a file system name, it actually creates a file system object uh, which persists after, even after the socket is closed. So it's something that programmers need to be aware of that when, you, when you're using these sockets and binding them to names that you may have to clean up afterwards and delete the file system node manually. And who is responsible for doing that, the client or the server? Um, well, typically, it's, it's typically only happens on the server side because clients don't need to bind explicitly to names. Yeah. But it's the user code that's making use of this feature has to take care of, of deleting that file after server socket channel is closed. Well, it's not a limitation, but that uh, is something that is set in the in the protocol. So it's not a limitation of the API. That's typically how it works, right? That's how it works on all Unix domain socket implementations. Well, there's there's an enhancement in Linux, which we may consider for a future version of this, where Linux has this notion of abstract names where a file system node doesn't get created. So what you lose with that is the file system security aspect, 
but what you gain then is is a model that's kind of closer to TCP IP. So, you know, once sockets are closed, the abstract name just disappears. Okay. Anything else to mention on the UDS API? Um, let me see. Yes, one probably one important feature is that that at the native level, Unix domain socket addresses are limited in length. So, for example, it's typically most operating systems would restrict um, a Unix domain socket address to be no more than around 100 bytes. So that could potentially pose a problem if you're using particularly long directory path names. Uh, but there are ways to kind of work around that, such as, for example, using relative path names. So if the client and the server are both have the same working directory, then that working directory can be in any arbitrarily deep path name but the relative path can be made sure that it's less than 100 bytes long. Those two are probably the two main uh, gotchas that people are, are likely to come across. So let's see. Uh, well, we've discussed the HTTP client API. We've discussed Unix domain socket channels and uh, some other JEPs. So I think that we can uh, quickly discuss about uh, the future. The first thing that I would like to quickly discuss, so since a few days, we have a new JEP. JEP 408, simple web server. Uh, right now, it's a candidate JEP. So we're not sure yet in which release it will be targeted. But I think it's good to uh, quickly go over that one. So can one of you give us a quick overview of that JEP? So the background, first of all, is that the HTTP server uh, API was, was added way back in 1.6. And that was uh, there was a need in the platform for, I think it was, came originally from the JAX WS API. They needed a small, lightweight HTTP server implementation that would be usable, independent of, of any other HTTP server that, 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 that they are deployed with. But more recently, uh, since the platform, the Java platform was modularized, the HTTP server was moved into its own module called JDK.HTTP server. That opens some interesting possibilities, like, for example, it's possible to define an entry point into a module. Uh, it's a bit like running a jar file in the old way, where if you if you say Java minus jar, there's an equivalent now for modules. So, so we thought that this would be a useful way to start off a simple uh, static file server. So that's essentially what this JEP is aiming to deliver, a simple file server that's that's able to deliver static content. Um, and also an API then that people can use to develop that further if they want. It's a simple tool that's intended mostly for, for test use and for things like educational use. We don't really recommend that it's used in heavy duty production environments. That project is underway at the moment, as you, as you mentioned. Yeah, it's clearly not intended for production. And its name is also very clear on that. It's a simple web server. I also believe that in terms of HTTP capabilities, uh, it is limited. Yeah, it, it's it's just going to deliver static content. So it really just supports the get method. There's no way to post anything to it or put or do anything dynamic. Yeah, but still, that is a welcome addition because, uh, well, we are all running a locally web server just to do some very basic stuff while we are developing or testing. So I think that's something that is very welcome. Right. Um, we are running out of time, so uh, let's see. So, uh, yeah, HTTP3 is slowly emerging. So can we briefly discuss that? HTTP3 is in final stage of uh, standardization. We are watching the HTTP3 evolution. We are also uh, evaluating if it could be plugged into our HTTP client API, and we think the API uh, could support an implementation that supports HTTP 3. Mm -hmm. And in a nutshell, what is the key difference? The protocol itself is almost the same. The difference is that uh, HTTP 3 relies on Quick, which is a transport of a, a UDP. OK, thanks. So we'll have to wrap up. So is there anything you would like to add before we conclude? Loom is coming, so we are looking at making sure that our networking implementation will, will play nice with virtual threads. 
So that was a motivation for these two JEPs, JEP353 and 373. We are also considering adding a service provider interface for a net address uh, to help testing and customization and to allow for Loom-friendly implementation to be uh, developed and, and deployed. Yeah. Okay. Well, Michael, Daniel, I'd like to thank you for today's episode. But, you know, we have a, a small tradition. This show is called Inside Java. So can you give a, our listener a peek inside your day? So uh, who wants to start? Okay, Michael, I'll start. So I'm based in Dublin, Ireland, working from home like everyone else at the moment over, over Zoom and Slack. Typical working day, well, we'd have typically have meetings in the mornings with other team members here in Europe. Um, other days, we'd have meetings later in the afternoon with folks in the US, and then in between is when the work gets done. Apart from writing code and reviewing other people's work, one of my jobs at the moment actually is a job that we rotate around the group every month, which is triaging bug reports, which means taking the first look at them and making sure they get directed to the right person. And that's quite an interesting way to find out what other people are working on in, in, in the wider uh, core libraries team. Okay, cool. Daniel, what about you? I'm currently based in a small village north of Dublin, uh, working from home like everybody else. My day is not very uh, different. Meetings in the morning with the team and in the evening with the team which is located in the US. And uh, evaluating the reports, reviewing PRs, investigating bug fixes and, and new APIs. Cool. So Michael, Daniel, thanks again for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks very much for having me, David. Thank you very much. If you like this podcast, please make sure to spread the word and leave a review or a comment on the platform you're getting this podcast from. Thanks. Bye.